All right, I am in recording mode indeed. So uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Of course, like I said again, name is Vincent Webb, uh, FCS agent with North Carolina Cooperative Extension. So what we want to do is delve into some of these main objectives. Approved methods of home food preservation, criteria for choosing the best canning method, essential equipment, pathogens of concern, boiling water bath, and we're not gonna do pressure canning today. I might save that for another session, just be on the lookout for it. And again, I'll bring the equipment and you'll be able to see it and some of the product that we've actually pressure canned as well. Okay, some of the other uh, learning objectives, like I said, uh, we won't really get into any of these. Um, and a lot of times we, we kind of just breeze over uh, freezing and dehydrating, not because they're not important, it's just because most of the time they're, they're simple. Um, dehydrating might be a little bit uh, more nuanced than freezing. However, it's a simple process. It just might take a little longer. Um, largest botulism outbreak in 40 years. I was at a potluck in Ohio 2015. That was only five years ago. I know a lot has changed in five years, but the, um, just the, the science of food preservation has kind of stood the test of time with us get, uh, getting improved science, especially on these pathogens. A lot of times y'all in food safety, food science, uh, food preservation, those type of industries, the science around pathogens and bacteria, viruses, things like that is important um, because we wanna know how they operate. We wanna know how we can kill them. We wanna know how we can prevent them from getting into our product. And unfortunately, botulism is the one that's associated with improperly canned goods. So, like I said, it is uh, the bacteria of concern. And we'll get into a little bit more of the details about how this bacteria operates. Um, but as you can see, soup sold at three Southern California farmers markets. I mean, that hit three markets, y'all, three markets. So that's a, that's a big thing. So the father of canning, Nicholas up here, uh, 12,000 francs is what he sold his method of a food in glass bottles for. Um, I think today that translates into a little over, uh, uh, in a, a couple grand, a few grand. A little more history, of course, we all know Louis Pasteur, if we've taken a science class, a lot of times nowadays in the high school uh, sector, they'll even have Louis Pasteur talked about in those science classes. Um, and he provided the explanation for canning when he was able to demonstrate that the growth of microorganisms is the cause of food spoilers. That is a big one, y'all. That is a big one. Because not only do we have uh, uh, foods that be, can be contaminated because they're spoiled and the quality is just shot. But also, we can have things that look perfectly fine and still be contaminated with a bacteria or a virus or some type of microorganism that we can barely see. Well, hard, well we can't see at all. So, just gonna go with the quick basis of canning and get into that water bath is really what we wanna do today. Use high quality food to start. So the first class, if you were to come into our extension office in May and we were to actually be operating, you would do, we would do canning 101 as far as the basics of canning and we would talk about water bath and then we would talk also about pressure canning. But we would do strawberries. So one of my favorites to do with the clients when they come in May, prime strawberry season, strawberry jam. That's one of my favorites to eat and one of my favorites to do. I love it. Uh, unfortunately, this year I might not be able to do that um, unless I can get back in the kitchen at uh, the co-op. So using high quality berries is really where we wanna start when we do that jam. I usually purchase from a local farmer. Um, I don't get into favorites, although I do have my uh, favorites that I like to go to just because um, they always allow us to uh, go out there on the farm and do some demos. 
Place food into heated jars, of course. Heat food to a temperature that destroys the, the microbes. Uh, this inactivates the enzymes that cause spoilage as well. And the heating process, air is driven from the jars. And then when it cools, a lot of times when you take them out, you can still hear that, that pop, pop, pop. Kind of like um, uh, Little Mermaid. I know Sebastian was singing Under the Sea and you would hear all the bubbles go pop, pop, pop. That's, that's what we want to hear. So when I think of, do I have a good seal? I listen for that under the sea, pop, pop, pop. That's what I listen for. It kind of helps me remember. All right. So tested recipe from credible sources. Um, I may go live here, to, here today uh, just to show you some, some things that we utilize. We love the National Center for Home Food Preservation. It's kind of like the hub and it's housed at the University of Georgia. And just remind me to show y'all that. Um, I do not have, now that's the one thing, not, not Vincent. Actually, you know what? I actually might have my publications here today because I think I took them home. Because you always have to answer a question. And I actually did. I thought to bring them with me, so that is good. Um, yep, I brought them with me today, so I like the way I was thinking on that. I'll show them to you when we finish. Um, we have a home canning guide from the USDA and also a ball uh, blue book guide to preserving. So know which canning method to use and when. Your jars do matter. <laughs> you can't just take a reused peanut butter jar just because it's glass and decide you want to use it. Um, that would be a detriment because it will not seal. Test the gauge if you're using the pressure uh, canner. You want to get that tested annually. And we actually do that when we're in regular regular business, that is, um, and stuff like that. But if you do need one done, um, just email me and I can put, actually, I may go ahead and do that myself. Um, just go ahead and put my email in the chat box. If you have any questions, just go ahead and email me. Or if you need a counter check, just let me know because technically our office is still open. We just don't um, just have just people just waltzing in. So you have to call and set it up before. And that's no different from when we were open because I'm always running and gunning. It's better for me to set it up. So if you need that dial check, just let me know. Follow directions. Don't skip out on steps. I mean, steps, especially as if it's what we call in the food safety world a kill step, it can mean the difference between your product spoiling and actually being causing a foodborne illness and not. Now, some of them are optional and you'll have to read it and see if it's optional. And some of these recipes, by the time you do them, a couple times you'll know them like the back of your hand. Don't force a quick cool down because that allows that vacuum seal to actually just seal tight and you'll hear that. Um, check if lids are sealed properly. And usually what you'll do, you'll see if it's uh, concave and not convex. So concave just essentially means you'll see it dip in the center of the can. And sometimes um, you can do the old uh, tap trick and it'll, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll, do, they'll seal themselves. But um, usually if you look, you can see it. Your email isn't showing. Okay. Ah. Oh. Uh oh, I, I was in private mode. I don't know why. Okay, thank you. All right, see at All right, detoxify uh, questionable food. So go. So if you do have a product that um, did not seal, refrigerate immediately, or either you could try and redo. So I, I'm an advocate. But, you know, I grew up around a grandfather who always said, you do it right the first time so you don't have to double work. So I'm an advocate for it. Just make sure you do it right the first time. For high acid food only, high acid food only. If you, if you can be fuzzy on anything else, don't be fuzzy on this. All the, you know, all the other stuff, you know, we can, we can catch you up a little bit. But this right here, for high acid food only. That means if it's 4.6 below or below, that is considered a high acid 
food. All right. Acid kills Clostridium botulinum, better known in our food science world up at NC State as CVOP. Those spores is going to kill them. Uh, heat water to 212 degrees Fahrenheit to destroy pathogens and prevent spoilage. Okay, so CBOT does not like acid. However, it does like environments that lack oxygen. All right. But what do we do? We have an environment that's lacking oxygen. We add acid in order to keep that guy out. So we don't want to really get into the pressure canning methods. We'll skip right through that. Um, but what we do want to point out is the temperature needs to be hot enough to kill pathogens. Yeast mold and most bacteria are destroyed at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, boiling essentially when the, boil, uh, the water is boiling. Get that rolling boil. CBOT is an exception when you do have a food item that is uh, above 4.6. That's when you need to use the pressure can. All right. So this is the pH scale right here with uh, hydrochloric acid being all the way to the left, uh, one and below. That is what's in your stomach. And that's what one of your uh, lines of defenses is when you do eat something. Hopefully that acidity in your stomach will go ahead and kill it. But if you eat it at high dose, if you eat a food item and it's been contaminated under such a high dosage, a lot of times it'll 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 get you, it'll get you. And then we see lemon juice. Some recipes calls for lemon juice or vinegar or something like that. And it's best to use the bottled lemon juice if a recipe does call for lemon juice. And the only reason why is because you know if you get a lemon from a market or something like that. You don't know the acidity level unless you have pH strips or a pH meter. Um, and that is the only thing that I did not bring. I got books and everything. I wish I had got the pH strips to show you. And usually you can order those. I don't know how quick folks will be uh, nowadays. Um, sometimes they even sell them at cooking specialty stores. If you ask them, they'll probably try to get you to get a pH meter. But don't do that, especially if you're not selling to the public. But as you can see, as you go right, you get more basic. So high acid versus low acid, uh, I pretty much uh, went over that, but these are the main differences. Doing a little uh, comparison, um, high acid is uh, equal to 4.6 or below. Proves itself for figs and melons and tomatoes. Tomatoes tend to ride that line. Uh, fermented pickles, or simply sauerkraut fermented foods, acidified foods, traditional pickles. And then low acid is anything above 4.6, the pH scale of 4.6. Vegetables, most vegetables except for rhubarb, uh, your meat, poultry, and seafood groups, this out of the way, soups and mixtures of canned food like tomato sauce. Causes of spoilage in food, the growth of bacteria, molds, and yeast. Activity of food enzymes, reactions with oxygen. All right. Clostridium botulinum, this is a spore former, meaning that, yes, the bacteria exist in what we call vegetative form, where it's active, where it's moving, where it's multiplying. But as soon as it's not in an un, as soon as it's in an unfavorable environment, it's going to create a spore, which is a protective shell around it. And when the environment becomes favorable, i.e., when it gets out of that heat, and when it's put on your shelf, that's when it's going to do its work, and it's going to create a toxin. It's going to come out of spore form, and then it's going to create a. It's going to go into vegetative and uh, produce those toxins. So if you had one way to look at it, vegetative is essentially they're moving, they're active. So think of a plant. Once it goes from um, the seed, which would oftentimes be kind of like the spore, the seed, it needs an environment to actually grow. If you just got it on a seed packet, more likely, most likely it's not going to grow. 
unless it's been introduced to some type of element for growth, i.e. water. Um, so that's kind of like the spore. The spore is kind of like the seed. To enter into a vegetative state, it needs the favorable environment, just like a, a plant seed. You put it in the ground, it has warmth, it has moisture, it's going to sprout um, unless something digs it up. So it's gonna sprout. And that's when it's gonna go into vegetative and it's gonna actually grow. And a lot of times uh, when a plant is already sprouted in growth, that's when it actually needs to be protected. And some of them do have pretty good protective mechanisms, um, just like a vegetative um, cell for a sea bot. It needs a moist environment, low acid, okay? That means above 4.6. Temperature between 40 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit is where it thrives, less than 2% oxygen. So very, very reduced oxygen uh, environment. So a lot of these, not even just canning, but other things where it may have a reduced oxygen uh, environment could be uh, susceptible to sea bot. All right, I just um, told you about that. But do know the toxin that it, it produces, those vegetative cells, once they go live, <laughs> vegetative, uh, they will produce a neurotoxin. And unfortunately for some, it causes paralysis and even death. Um, even a taste. I remember when I first got to extension, uh, my boss at the time, my CED at the time, told me that a lady had just simply tasted a green bean and she was out. Granted, she was older. I think she was in her 70s, maybe. Um, and that's a susceptibility, as we know what, what's going on right now. Um, but nevertheless, it can happen to anybody with this particular bacteria. So preventing it. High acid, the spores won't germinate. And you dry, if you got a low acid food, you drive that heat up to 240 with that pressure canner, and you're good to go. Take a little sip of coffee there. Uh, pressure canner must be used for all low acid foods. Follow the recipe exactly, because with pressure canning, oftentimes, and both really, something is added in the recipe, <laughs> unless it says optional, that step, especially when it's dealing with the acidity, the time, the temperature, things like that, those are all kill steps. So skipping out on those steps may not be good for you. Now, we do have the green bean recipe where we use the pressure canner and it says, oh, you can do salt or you cannot do salt. That's optional. That's just for taste. All right. Following the recipe exactly, I think I've hammered that in, in pretty good. I think I've uh, um, you know, got all my, my little rivets in there, tied down tight. I don't have to say much more on that. Um, and all of this also depends on the size of the jar. As you will see, when I um, put the little uh, 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 website for National Center for Home Food Preservation in there, when you go and look at those recipes, it'll show you what you need for half pint, pint, quart. It'll show you exactly what you need. And some things are better when you use wide mouth and all that stuff, um, or, or, net, or what we call regular mouth, and I'll show you all of that. And most of you have already came before, so you've seen it. So temperature decreases at a given pressure as altitude increases. Okay. So in a lot of places like the Rockies, i.e. the Rockies, uh, it's hard to do a lot of these things concerning uh, building pressure because of the altitude. Um, as increased pressure, as you got to increase the pressure as the altitude increases. So if it's above 2,000 feet elevation, you want to go up to two, 12 PSI. If you were normally canning at 11, you want to go up to 12. Here in Greensboro, here in Guilford County, we don't, we don't really have those issues, OK? Um, as you go out west, you might have to consider some things. Um, altitude adjustment requires increase of 5 PSI uh, per pressure with the weighted gauge. That's if you're using a weighted gauge there. Uh, 1,001 feet and above process at 15 pounds of pressure. All right. That's if you have that weighted gauge. 
we only have a few of those at the office. Um, I mean, before COVID-19, I was actually going to open up a program where people could actually uh, rent equipment and stuff. Now, we had to come up with a system with, you know, we got to get that equipment back. But nevertheless, I want to make sure the community has a chance to get into the art of can. Um, boiling water bath canner. All right. So this is where um, I'll go through the packing methods and I'll go through the headspace and then I'll start showing you some equipment. I think I got a little bit too far in the pressure can in there. I didn't mean to do that. Um, hot packs, methods of packing. The preferred method for most foods is hot pack. I mean, you gotta heat your jam, you gotta heat your jelly, you gotta heat your apple, things like that. Most of the time, those foods, are, uh, preferred method is uh, cooking the food essentially, essentially, that's what you do, um, and then you put it into the jar. And the water should be simmering when the jars are placed in the canner, all right? If directions only list hot pack method, then only use that, it's a reason. Um, a lot of times it may be a quality issue, but sometimes it could be a safety issue, all right? Raw packs for food that loses its shape when cooked, this is what you wanna do, all right? Now, if you want those, uh, what we call state fair green beans with the all perfectly placed in a little jar and um, you wanna see them all just lined up perfectly, uh, raw pack is probably gonna be your one if you're just trying to win a prize. I'm um, not saying that they can't be done safely. However, those are the ones you see on the sites, they look really good. Uh, opposed to your standard canned green beans where you just cook them before, put them in and stuff like that. And that's for um, just, uh, that's, uh, I don't even know why I use that because that's for pressure canning, but same, same, uh, same principle. Um, water should be hot and you want to pack them firmly. We don't want any floaties in there. All right, we want to get it as firm as possible because um, a lot of times you'll have what we call fruit float. It'll float to the top. Um, and this can even happen with jams and jellies. It's simply when the syrup separates um, from the actual uh, fruit part and then the fruit part just floats on top. And that's not always a bad thing. You just have to stir it up. Okay. Head space. Uh, space between inside of the lid and the top of the food or liquid. A lot of your jams and jellies will be quarter inch. Um, the, direct, the recipe will actually direct you and what you need to do. That head space is there for a reason. It is there so that there may be proper uh, driving out of the air when you get ready to process, all right? Too full, it might not happen. Um, fruits, tomatoes, and pickles usually half inch head space. Um, is usually sufficient. I think, uh, mm, I want to say for green beans, we might have did an inch, but I cannot uh, remember. I do remember my, my jelly and uh, jams because we do those quite often or something like them, especially with that apple butter. Uh, quarter inch, quarter inch. All right, so um, two little head space. Uh, food may bubble out during the process. And you don't want that. Deposit on the rim may create a poor seal. So that's why we wipe for four. Uh, we put that, um, that lid up there and tie that and, uh, and tighten that band, okay? Too much headspace, food at the top is likely to discolor, all right? And like I said, it might not, it might have something to do uh, also with not sealing properly. So check for cracks and rough edges. Um, I'm gonna stop share really quick just to be able to show you. So we have a, uh, this is a pint size. Um, actually one of my favorites out of the jars because uh, it has a nice little kind of like square light shape. Um, and this one actually has the little graduations on it. I know you can't see it, but it does have the graduations on it. If you could ever get a hold of one of these, um, they're good even for keeping around the house for measurements. Uh, you don't even have to have measuring cups when you have these. Um, and this one is a regular mouth. Yeah. All right, let's see here. We have a wide mouth. Okay. 
This is a cur. Um, you probably can't see it. Uh, some of them you can get ball, you can get cur. One of my participants and a lady that actually helped me with a hand, uh, canning class at one point um, when we did green beans, she actually prefers cur. Uh, what I'm about to show you next, not necessarily the, the jars, but she prefers uh, the bands and the lids. So this is a band. Um, you do have to watch these guys. They, they will rust on you. Um, so watching them. Uh, and then these lids. Now, once they are used, you can see it has a nice seal on it. And the way I always can tell if they've been really been used, now some of them you can't tell. We did actually have one where uh, some lids were donated to me um, and I didn't know that one of them got used and one of my participants, her stuff didn't seal. Uh, and um, she had to take it home and refrigerate it. But the way you can tell, usually it'll be kind of smooth. It'll have smooth and it won't, you won't see any type of uh, imprint or debris. If it's being used, you can definitely see an imprint, especially if it's been on something for a very long time. But if somebody just threw it on something, and these guys are uh, somewhat delicate, so somebody can use it and not actually process with it. They can just use it to uh, cover something, and it can actually um, destroy the integrity of the of the lid seal. And um, food is notorious for getting stuck in there, so make sure they're good to go. I usually keep them in a little pot, warm, um, like the recipes all uh, pretty much tell you to do. And I like to go ahead and uh, pull them out as I need them. Of course, wide them out. Bam, lid. We have a lot of these right now. And I, I can see why. Um, let me go back to PowerPoint. Let's see here. Uh oh. Get all mixed up on how to share my screen. I've done this a dozen times. All right, here we go. Get back in there. All right, there we go. Um, as I said, can't reuse the flat lid. Keep hot until use and make sure you adjust for proper hand space and make sure you do uh, fingertip tight on those bands. Um, that uh, sometimes it doesn't really, it doesn't really do any detriment, but it'll be that one time you, uh, you, you wrench it down and um, you, you, you mess with the sealing process. Um, so I know I'm heavy handed. I just gotta make sure I don't poke it. Each food has its own processing time. Follow directions, don't try to cross recipes. Now, sometimes if you get in a bind, if you know that this jam or jelly is very much like this, it's just a variety of a certain uh, ber berry or grape or something like that, then if you get in a bind, you can, you can cross it um, and things like that. However, if it's a totally different food item, mm-mm, mm-mm. Uh, undercooked or underprocessed potential spoilage affects safety. Over overdoing it or overprocessing, not necessarily the worst thing in the world, but you might over you might actually. Uh, so if you had a hot pack and you essentially cooked it, you throw it in there and you overprocess, then you overcook. It affects the quality as well, and I can deal with overcooking, but if it's undercooked, that means that it's a safety issue and not a quality issue. So what affects the processing time? It could be the acidity because we know acid, I mean, think about it. When you do a marinade, you partially cook the meat, right? From the marinade because the marinade oftentimes has an acid product, whether that be a citrus juice, whether that be a vinegar uh, or something of the sort or something that's fermented like wine or something like that. Um, preparation of food could affect it. Composition of the food, i.e cooking it before you put it in the jar, composition of the food, how big it is, how viscous it is. I mean, some of the, sometimes we get those jams out after um, sitting on the shelf for a couple months, you get those things out, you have to pop that knife up, those things are thick. Uh, transfer of heat, initial temperature of the food pack, and the temperature of processing. 
Those are some things you have to consider. So step by step, sterilizing the jars is necessary. Um, usually I'll use the good old dishwasher um, and keep them in there before the classes or from at home, I'll just stick them in a the dishwasher. And when it's, it's uh, kind of try to time it right where the dishwasher is just getting done, um, maybe a 15 to 30 minutes before I get ready to can because those dishwashers can hold pretty, pretty hot. If you've ever uh, mistaken and gotten your face close to one when you opened it, you know. Uh, start with enough water in the boiling water bath canner. Now, when it's boiling, you bring it up to that rolling boil, you might have to add some more before you put your jars in, and that's okay. Evaporation happens. Add food packed. Uh, check the head space, remove the air bubbles. Um, my behind, uh, sometimes I get, all right, here we go. I'm gonna stop sharing. So this guy is the little spatula, and I like it because it has these little graduations, and it has uh, your little quarter inch. You can't see it, so don't try to squint to see it. It has your quarter inch, your half inch, your three-fourths inch, and your inch. And I like this uh, guy because you can put them around just like that, or you can simply use a little spatula, a little silicone that'll go around and they make little cute ones like that at the Dollar Tree, if you can get into the Dollar Tree at this time. Uh, th this right here is your magnetic, magnetic lid lifter. I don't know if I have the fancy looking one. I don't think I do. Might have it down there. Actually, I do. Um, this one is just fancy because it, it's retractable. Um, I, oh, there you go. It has the retract. And it allows you to pick the lid up and then once you got it placed, you can just press it down instead of having to uh, do the finger Tetris on top of the jar. Um, let's see. Oh, funnels, good for uh, pouring the food in so you don't make a mess. Now, with a wide mouth, you can pretty much just dead eye and get it. But sometimes with a narrow mouth, especially for beginners, they have a, they have a hard time with, uh, with getting it right. So they use that right there. Um, one of my personal favorites. Have you ever seen one of these? It's a food mix. Let's go ahead and put a lot. Some people use them. Um, I know some folks that use them for like potatoes and stuff, but I like to use them for our jams and jellies, get those strawberries down in there, get a little bit of, uh, get it uh, uh, down fine. And um, someone was so gracious, uh, also the person who donated before and they gave me this retractable uh, lid lifter. Uh, the dog is shaking in the background. Um, this one is retractable as well. So you can go down, grab it, bring it up, and it makes for some extra security. Now, the traditional uh, lid lifter, just simply, and it's not retractable, but you, you know, you got your grip and you can hold it down. Now, inside of the canner, you have a rack, and it actually sits on top just like that and I'll bring up the actual canner let me scoop back a little bit and it can actually sit on top so if I bring my computer screen down you can see and it sits on top just like that all right that's good so that you can safely place your jars in and then got your oven mitts on or your towel and then you can lower it down and put them down and then you can get a safe bowl um, I like that uh, you do have to replace these probably every once in a while, um, maybe every couple of seasons because they and wipe them off good. This one is relatively new, uh, but they do have, a, uh, they are prone to get rust, to get rust. Um, mainly on where the hinges are, that's where they get the rust. Uh, let me go back to screen share mode. Okay, wipe the jar lids, put the lids on, lower the jar slowly onto the rack, and lower that right on down into the water. Of course, put the lid on the counter. Now, you know when you put that in there. I don't know why. I've turned into a little bit of a car guy uh, over my time at Extension, um, mainly because I've entered into the Camaro world. However, 
There's always this thing saying, uh, what do they say? There's no replacement for displacement. That helps me remember. Okay, so when I put these drives in there, you're gonna get displacement. Your water level is gonna rise a little bit. You do need to make sure it's adequately covering the jars. About three to four inches is sufficient. Um, however, you know when you add that displacement, you know that there has to be a little bit of time for it to come back up to a rolling boil. And that's when you start the countdown. And then what I always do with my participants whenever we do a canning class. At first, they gave me a little bit of a fuss when I first started doing the classes, but I said, no, y'all, I want to make sure that they're sealed properly because I don't know what you do between my place and home. You might have three different stops you got to make. You might have a, a long ride back home. You might, you know, I don't know. You might drive like you're on NASCAR. I don't know. So what I do, I allow for that 12 to 24 hour uh, time and I allow them to come back and pick them up later. Now, if you do live, because we did have a, uh, two participants that did out of state, if you live out of state, I just put it in a nice little small box and I uh, kind of cradle it like a baby so it doesn't move a lot and you can get away with it, but that's only for out of state or very, very far individuals, meaning they got about a one to two hour drive. Uh, check that lids are sealed properly. So after that 24, 12 to 24, bare minimum 12, usually when I get back in the office the next day, I'll check them. Or if I'm at home, when I wake up, I'll just go ahead and check them. Uh, we're going to stop right here with the pressure canning. I don't, oh, the only thing that I did not show you um, before I get ready to show you these guys and share some resources uh, was our apple butter. So we did apple butter. Um, that's the apple butter that we did. I want to say this was uh, about a year ago um, and stuff like that. And I'm surprised because the participants, they always drag me into it. And I said, well, y'all know I can kind of do this anytime. They say, oh, no, Vincent, you have to make a jar too. So I end up making a, a jar for myself. Um, this is one of our go-tos, uh, the Blue Book. Sometimes you can order it from Amazon because I don't know if Ball uh, actually has, they might have them in stock. You might have to call. And unfortunately, um, there was a ball factory, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not originally from Guilford County, but we used to have a uh, ball that was in another county that was in the vicinity, um, and they closed down uh, a few years ago. But yeah, this one is a go-to. I like it because the recent ones, um, our folks up at NC State did a little bit of research, and um, they, uh, I think they might have even reached out to ball. However, those recipes and the other books that they produce, they might not always be tested. And that's why we drive folks to, to this guy right here, the blue book, the blue book. Uh, home canning uh, guy right here, USDA home canning. You can get this via PDF. You look it up, you can get it via PDF electronically, or you can have them send you one and you can order it. Um, and pretty much anything that's in here will probably be on the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Let me go live at this instance so I can show you that. National. Is it down there? Haven't had to look at it recently. Um, let's see. Go back into screen share mode and boom. Okay. So this is the National Center for Home Food Preservation, all right? You can go anywhere, and on the left, you just simply say, okay, I want to do jam jelly. It's time for strawberries, all right? You go to jams. Oh, man, look at that. Apple preserves, strawberry jam, right there. And it tells you the style, hot pack, always going to be hot pack for uh, jams and jellies, half pints or pints. Most people are not doing quarts, so they just have those right there. And they roughly, they have the same process in time for those, but it will let you know when it does not. And everything right here with the steps, uh, all of that. Um, let's see here. You have some jellies. Let's see if you wanted to get into fermenting. It does have sauerkraut, dill pickles. In my class, whenever we do fermenting, we also do kimchi. Um, and that's the one you're guaranteed to take home because uh, kimchi, 
you really don't can. You just allow it to ferment uh, for a few days and then you're ready to go, especially if you like a little bit of spice in your life. Um, that's good. Uh, they do have things on freezing, dry, uh, curing, smoking, uh, drying. We actually wanted to do a jerky making class. Hopefully, uh, we'll be um, in a place where uh, we can go to, to a somewhat level of normal in the fall, and we'll be ready for that jerky. Uh, I, I called upon the livestock agent to kind of help a brother out because uh, he knows his meat. So hopefully we'll be able to get that going and stuff like that. Um, but let me let me copy that, this particular uh, thing in here um, as far as the website goes. So I want you guys to have that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know that jerky class going to be good. Uh-huh. Yeah, everybody wants the jerky class, huh? Um, so, uh, are there any questions so far just about the basics of water bath canning? I think I showed you everything I wanted to show you. I don't know if anybody's thinking about starting a food business, um, but we also have some folks. Um, we haven't gotten many calls for that, and the NCDA might be a little bit slow on things, but we can also, also kind of point people in the right directions with that if folks ever want to know, and you have my email. All right. Oh, okay. Well, uh, thank you guys for participating. If you do have any questions, you can email me. I'm gonna do once again, like the preachers back home used to do, are all hearts and minds clear? Okay. All right, I'm gonna stop recording. And if you were just waiting for me to stop recording,